Welcome back to another episode of the Bigger Than Me podcast. Here is your host, Aaron P. Thank you so much for tuning into another Bigger Than Me podcast episode. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and comment to show your support. Today, we will be exploring Métis culture, their language, their art, their music, and how they fit into Canadian history with the author of The Northwest is Our Mother. My guest today is Jean Taillé. Welcome, Jean. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm wondering if you would be able to do a very brief introduction and background about yourself to get people familiarized with you. So my name is Jean Taye, and I am a recently retired uh, lawyer, and that's like 11 days retired. I have been for the past uh, 25-some-odd years an Indigenous rights lawyer um, litigating at the Supreme Court of Canada and all other levels of court, as well as um, a treaty negotiator. I uh, work for mostly for First Nations and for Métis Nation, and I've also I'm also an author. I've written The Northwest is Our Mother, which is a history of the Métis Nation, as well as a book called Métis Law in Canada and multiple other articles. And um, I also do a lot of public speaking and writing. So that's me in a nutshell, my legal life anyway. Brilliant. Well, I'm going to ask you to take us all the way back to the beginning where you were a writer, a dancer, a choreographer, a director, (laughs) a producer. Would you mind taking us back to those 20 years of your life and some of the highlights that you experienced? Uh, Well, I I was uh, primarily... uh, I'm, and I'm back to being an artist again. I've always been an artist, and um, I like making things. It's really what it comes down to, um, as you can see by the thread behind me. Um, a lot of my work is in fiber arts. Um, so, But I started out when I was a teenager writing for a radio station in Winnipeg, and that was broadcast over through Ontario, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and North Dakota, Minnesota, and I think into Montana. And so I I wrote a one minute editorial every day, um, and it was uh, it was my first um, input into uh, writing, and it was basically I could write anything I wanted, and so I did. Uh, and they never edited me or told me what to write or said I couldn't say whatever I wrote. And so I did that for, you know, I think it was about four or five years, maybe less. I can't remember. Um, and then, um, but I also was very interested in dance. So I um, did that, really danced for quite a few years. I danced, um, I was a modern dancer. I danced with Toronto Dance Theatre primarily on a few other companies, Um as a sort of, you know, occasional dancer. I choreographed for theater, um, theater workshop productions, um, uh, quite a few other places, um, in mostly in Toronto. And, um, and I also had a, have had a long career as a visual artist, um, with works hanging in, um, you know, some private collections in, the United States and um, a few public and pi- private places in uh, Canada. And uh, then I went to law school at 38. And that was um, a big change. And uh, m- mind you, I'd wanted to, I, I wrote the law school exams when I was like 20, at the same time as I was, as I was auditioning for dance companies. And uh, I decided that in mm, Dance is like being, is an athletic thing. You really have to do it when you're young. And in my mind, I said, well, you can be a lawyer when you're 40, which at that time was about as old as I could imagine being. Um, And uh, so sure enough, around it's at 38 that I went to law school. Um, So just kind of moved over to the other side of of my brain. (laughs) And and then I've spent that um, since then uh, in law. And uh, now I'm back in my um, creative uh, creative mode again. So, yeah. There's one piece I'd like to ask about specifically, and it's the two-row wampum belt sitting mm-hmm. in the University of Toronto. Would you yeah. mind sharing with the listeners the meaning behind that belt? 
Yeah, it's it's a Haudenosaunee. That's sort of the Six Nations uh, tradition. And so what happened was I, my first day of law school at the University of Toronto, I walked in and there was a very large, big brass plaque on one of the walls. And I mean large, like, you know, 12 feet high by, you know, 10 feet wide. And it had uh, statements about the law from the Torah. And one of the statements said, there shall be one law for you and the stranger among you. I might be misquoting that slightly, but it, you get the gist. And I remember standing in front of that on my very first day of law school and thinking, well, that's not right. That's not what I, you know, I'm, I'm, I should have said in my introduction, I'm also a member of the Manitoba Métis Federation. And I am, as my, one of my elders, Maria Campbell says, introduce yourself by who are your people and where are you from? I'm a um, member of the Riel family. My grandmother was Sarah Riel. Um, my great grand uncle, her uncle was, was Louis Riel. So my great grandfather was Louis's little brother. And I was born in up right on, literally on the banks of the Red River in, so I am your classic Red River Métis. And I stood in front of that plaque that day and I said, well, that's sure not what I thought. Uh, or was taught, you know, I had always believed that there were indigenous people had their own laws. And, um, and I also knew that there's, you know, there's military law, and there's, there's Catholic law, and there's Jewish law, there's all kinds of law out there, there's not one law for you and the stranger among you. And then the other thing that bugged me about that statement was, well, if there's one law for you, the stranger among you, then surely you settlers are the strangers. And she should be our law. That should be the one law, right? So I, I really didn't like it, and it really bugged me. So um, I, after that, you know, in the first week or so, met the other Indigenous law students there. There were nine of us, or nine of us, or eleven of us, I think that year. We were the 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 peak. That's the most Indigenous students U of T has ever had was that year. And then I think there were like nine or something the year after. And there were three or something the year before us. So we were at that, you know, in those years I was there, that we were the biggest amount of Indigenous students at the University of Toronto ever. And so we did things. <laughs> and, um, um, so the the wampum belt, I started talking about it with at the, we called ourselves the Native Law Students Association. Um, I started talking to them about this thing that bugged me. And we just, we started talking about it, all of us. And we said, well, why don't we try and get another symbol of indigenous law in the law school and put it up? And so we, but we didn't want to appropriate another indigenous people's symbol without, you know, talking to them in permission. So we invited the um, holder of the two row wampum belt uh, to the U of T from Six Nations and he came and he talked to us about it, what it means, and um, and then we asked him if we made a replica of it, would that be wrong? And he said, no, 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 not at all, as long as you say it's a replica. And and uh, and then we said, well, and if we put a plaque under it that says description of it, um, can we send it to you so we get the wording right, and then you can send it back? And he said, absolutely. So I went off and beaded it. So what it is, is it's um, a white row and a purple row, thin purple row, and another white row, and another thin purple row, and another white row. And so it's called two row because it's the two purple rows. And really the symbolism behind it is that Indigenous people have their laws and customs and, um, and live in the one purple row, and the settlers have their laws and customs and they live in another, in the other purple row. And the white rows in between are about respect and trust and honesty and communication and all of those things. And the belief was that the two rows could live in parallel with each other as long as there was respect and honesty and, and a dignity afforded to each side. Uh, and that's the idea of it. So two laws that work in parallel with each other. So we, I beaded it. Um, 
Uh, Marty Bayer, who was from um, Manitoulin Island, uh, an Ojibwe guy, brought back beautiful birch bark rods and hawk feathers and and deer skin strips. And so we took my wampum belt and we sort of uh, made a sort of a leafed it into a frame and hung the hawk feathers from it. And then we drafted up a plaque and we sent it to the, um, the and I'm sorry, I've totally forgotten his name. Um, and, and he said, no, that sounds great. I think he made a, maybe made a couple of changes to, to it. And then we gifted it to the University of Toronto and uh, to the dean then, who was Bob Sharp, who was later on the Court of Appeal for Ontario. And um, uh, then they hung it in a really prominent place, just as you were coming out of the library and down the steps into what was called um, Flavelle Hall, which was now, they just rebuilt U of T. But um, anyway, it was, it was given a very prominent um, position there. Um, and one of the interesting things is that they've put the new the new law school now up, and that brass plaque is gone, uh, but the two row wampum belts still there. Awesome. <laughs> so, yeah, so that was the story, and I think it was great that U of T accepted it and placed it and did all that. So it was all was um, it was a good. I believe very much that symbols are really important um, to have, so that, because people. People look at them and they absorb them. That's a beautiful story. In the beginning of The Northwest is Your Mother, you talk mm -hmm. about how there's a risk of the Métis being treated like the forgotten people, that mm -hmm. they walked so lightly on the land in so many ways that there's a risk that they don't get the acknowledgement, the understanding, the recognition that they deserve. Would you mind describing from your perspective who the Métis people are for people who may just be starting to learn about Métis people now? Yeah, the the word itself, Métis, is very confusing. So I think to anybody who's listening, if you're confused about who the Métis are, you're in good company and you're right to be confused because it is confusing. So, and that's because um, it, what happened really is in the 1960 era, uh, people started to become very aware of uh, language. Uh, a lot of this comes out of um, a man named Franz Fanon, who was an African writer who started writing about naming um, and how we use words like mulatto and half-breed and, um, you know, Negro and all of those kinds of things. And the fact uh, how discriminatory the language is in the naming. And so people became very aware that are English people, let's put it that way, who had always called Métis prim primarily half-breeds, became aware that half-breed was a very derogatory term. So, and it is derogatory because it really means that you are half of something. You're not, you're not a whole anything. You're just half of this or half of that. The use of the word breed is also very troubling. I mean, we breed animals. We don't breed people, right? So if you're calling a person a half-breed, you're calling them half an animal. And it doesn't take a lot to guess which half is the animal, right? And the other part of it is that a half-breed connotes almost like a mule. Like you have nothing that you can, you're, you're neutered. You, you have nothing that you can pass on. You know? And it also completely creates you as an individual and not as a member of a collective. So it's a, it just, that one word alone, just completely um, severs that person from any collective at all, and especially an indigenous collective. So the, the Métis, of course, in French, and the bulk of the Métis nation have always called themselves Métis or Métis or Métifs, um, that that has been the language that they use. But of course, the English never did that. They all, the English people always called them half-breeds. So the, the who are the Métis? As far as I'm concerned, the Métis are the people who are the... Um, members of the Métis Nation. And the Métis Nation is primarily the people who came into existence in the late 1700s in the prairies, primarily. Now that territory kind of spills over a bit into Ontario, a bit into the United States, 
a little bit into BC, maybe a little bit into the Northwest Territories, but the bulk of it, the real bulk of it is centered on the prairie provinces. And the so they're the people that we would today think of as Louis Riel's people. Although Louis Riel was not the first leader by any means, he's, you know, three or four generations in um, to the creation of the Métis Nation. But that's who I'm talking about. I do not use the word as a simple um, reference to anybody who has mixed ancestry. I don't use it to refer to First Nations people who lost their status or whose, you know, grandmother married a white guy and lived like a or any of the people in Eastern Canada um, who have lately picked up the word Métis and are starting to call themselves Métis. So I don't think that that's appropriate. But um, what I think about the use of the word is absolutely irrelevant. The horse has left the barn on that one. Like It's just out there and everybody's using the word. And that's why everyone's confused about it is because anybody who has so much as an ever so great Indian grandmama from 1702 now that maybe they didn't even know about for 300 or 400 years is suddenly calling themselves Métis. Well, that's, I think that's just a fantasy, but, um, but that's what's happening. So, you know, my, my solution to this would be to suggest to the Métis nation that we should call ourselves the Michifs, the Chief nation and let everybody else fight over Métis. <laughs> but, um, I'm not a politician. I'm not in power. And so I doubt that that's going to happen. But it, it is a problem, the word. So that's who I'm talking about is the people that we would now think of as Louis Riel's people. There's a, a strong movement right now to understand history, I think, uh, in, in a good way. But to me, there's also this very dangerous path that we're on, that we're sort of just looking at history as uh, a terrible atrocity and that we say white people came over and caused all these problems for indigenous people and, and that was it. And I often point to the Métis people as an example that there could have been and there was collaboration among First Nations people and people coming across from other lands and that that was something both communities benefited from. It didn't have to go the way that it went with the English. It didn't have to be that way, that we did have healthy relationships. We did have trade and it was something that was good. So when we look back on history, we have to somewhat embrace the ambiguity and the complexities of these relationships as they were. Certainly, it was never all good or all bad. But right now, I do feel like so many people are looking back at history and just saying everything that was going on was bad and everybody in the past was bad and, and Indigenous people have just had a terrible time of it. And certainly, there are pieces of that that are absolutely true, but it's far more complicated. Do you have the same understanding? Do you have concerns? when we look back at history and kind of just have one one narrative around it? Uh, I, I certainly think that history is always more complicated than a simple narrative. Um, and my when I was writing the book, <laughs> that was so clear to me. I, I so often would come across a single event where would, there would be seven different stories all coming from different perspectives, all about the same event, and some of them totally irreconcilable. Some of them could live together if you kind of uh, looked at them. But uh, no, history is incredibly complicated. And I, I never think there's uh, the good guys are not always good. <laughs> and the bad guys are not always bad. They're, I mean, they, the bad guys can be bad sometimes and good sometimes. And history is like that. I, I don't think there's a simple story anywhere. I think the problem with our history in Canada until pretty recently is that no one was even trying to tell the Indigenous side of the story. And so that was what I was trying to do with the book. I wasn't trying to say, well, everything you've said is wrong. I'm just saying, yeah, but there's this other story here. And so when I was writing it, I was always asking myself, okay, this happened. So what were they, they, by them, I mean the Métis, what were they thinking? Why did they do what they did? Not, you know, not the simplistic stories that we got from, you know, the settlers who wrote the his the histories, right? But okay, just turn it around and say, well, that that doesn't make a lot of sense if you were the Métis people standing there. So what were they thinking? What were they doing? Why would they do this thing? 
Uh, so that's what I was trying to do. Not say you're wrong, although sometimes their stories are wrong, you know, um, but not always. Um, and so, you know, I, th I think it's just more a point of adding another thread or two to the story. And so, you know, I can tell I wrote that whole story of basically the Métis Nation in there, but I could not add in there the First Nations thread, right? And that's a whole huge thread that no one else has written yet, right? right? That would be really fascinating to write because, and just for example, the 1885 resistance, um, we know that the First Nations, the Cree, were engaged in that resistance as well, but they were not working with the Métis. They were on their own trajectory. They went to war for their own reasons and they followed their own path. And yet it always it often gets bundled all together. Well, I wrote the Métis side of the story or tried to write the Métis side of the story. We've long had the English side of the story, but where's the Cree story in there? You know, I'd, I, that would really be nice. Now, some people have started to write it, um, Blair Stone Child and and Bill Weiser have been trying to, you know, add to that story. But there are there are other perspectives on it, you know, and it just makes it richer, you know, makes us understand that that none of this is simple. So I so agree with you that it's not a simple story. Um, and I, I think it's good, ultimately, that actually Indigenous histories are being published now. But but I, I think we're missing massive stories. I I was given the opportunity to publish the story of the Métis Nation, but where is the history of the Cree Nation? Where is the history of the Stalo Nation? Although we've got a beautiful Stalo Atlas, which is yes. great. But where's the history of the Mi'kmaq? Where's the history of Six Nations? You know, somebody, and I mean this like not academic books, but a popular history. I was given the chance to write a popular history, right? Which means it's sort of easy to read, not too many dates and footnotes and things like that, just an easy read. Where's Where are all those stories? Those are missing. We haven't got those yet, and we need them. I couldn't agree more, and I really yeah. enjoyed uh, how you wrote the book because it was so easy to absorb, and it took you on this journey, and it gave me a deeper appreciation. I, I've worked as a Native court worker. I understand. I understood that there were Métis people, but I didn't understand the culture, the history, uh, the values, the language, the music. I, I got to learn all of that and get insights onto the distinctness of being Métis and have a deeper appreciation of that as a consequence of reading your book. So I'm wondering if we can also talk about the process of making that music. When you started talking about the voyageurs and how many songs they would play and how like a good day would, I think, have 25 different songs. 50, sung. 50. 50 songs was That's a good fantastic. day. That's what they said. <laughs> yeah. Can you tell us about the music and that side of it? Yeah, the, I, I totally fell in love with the voyageurs when I was writing that part of it. And that's another story that, believe it or not, is not out there in Canadian history. No one's written a popular history of the voyageurs. They, they pop up in, you know, various stories a little bit here and a little bit there, but no one's actually written a wonderful story about them. And they're phenomenal. Uh, these guys, they were, they were fascinating and they are the fathers of the Métis nation. So where they are is most of them come, you know, I can't remember the numbers, um, but, but let's just broadly say like 85% of them come from a very particular area of Quebec around Trois-Rivières. And, so, and that's interesting all by itself, that they're just coming from this one very small area of Quebec. And they're, they're unique. You know, these guys there, so their music was phenomenal. So I'm married to a musician. My husband's a composer, conductor, arranger rock and roll, plays, plays everything. And um, when I came, I used to, while I was writing the book, so I'm up here in my little, I call it my little uh, attic room. Um, and this is where I wrote the book, a lot of it. And I would come downstairs all the time and I'd come downstairs and I'd go, did you know that? <laughs> but this, be full of all these things that I was learning. And one of them that I found was that the voyagers, if you had a good singing voice, you got paid more than the other voyagers did. Right. And I was just, that, I was kind of blown away by that. 
And I was listening to Voyager music while I was um, while I was writing that section, and just you know imagining because I've done a lot of canoe trips in my life, and just imagining what it was like when they were paddling along those rivers and lakes, and and there were so many stories. Overwhelmingly, everyone who encountered the Voyagers talked about their singing, and. People, a very famous Irish poet, Thomas Moore, came through the Great Lakes and he said something, I'll, I'm paraphrasing, but something like he had been in the finest concert halls in Europe and heard the great, you know, symphonies and operas and music, but nothing had touched his soul as much as one night when he was, pad- when they were paddling, I think, on one of the Great Lakes and uh, one voyager group met another and they they were sort of like almost like trains of like we, there could be 20 canoes in a in a group uh, with you know 10 guys in each one and he said and they all started singing and it was misty on the water and he said it was just the most heartbreaking uh thing he'd most beautiful thing he'd ever heard in his life and you can imagine like 200 men's voices singing out on the water like that. They all talked about it. Everybody who encountered them talked about how beautiful the music was. Well, this musical tradition then comes down to the Métis because this is their fathers and their grandfathers. And they are taught all those voyager songs. And some of the songs are wonderful. Some of them are what they call complaints, which would be um, sort of rueful, mystic kind of ballads. A lot of them dreaming about living somewhere permanently because these guys were always on the move. Um, But a lot of them were funny songs and some of them were kind of jazzy and where they, and you know, you can imagine sometimes they'd be going through a Canyon or something and their voices would echo off the walls of the Canyon and they would just repeat words that sounded back and forth across to that's jazz <laughs> you know, that's what that that is um so it's all kinds of things and they also did little plays and songs around the campfire at night when they were there so they were very lively and they're very noisy that was the other thing is the voyagers and the metis that's the other thing that came across to me over and over again is that everybody complained about how noisy the metis were when they were in the camps they you know the, the First Nations complained about how noisy they were, and the settlers complained about how noisy they were. And they it was like, because they would, they sang and they talked and everything while they were traveling. And then when they stopped, you'd think they'd want a little bit of peace and quiet, but nope, the fiddles would come out. they just <laughs> dance and sing all night long. And so, and nobody else liked that. <laughs> but, but they clearly did. So it's a very vibrant people full of, you know, joie de vivre. And and they are constantly on the move and constantly singing. And and to me, that was just extraordinary. So I think they get a lot of that from their Voyager fathers. It comes down to them from there, this sense of, of song and poetry and dance and music that they still go through today i mean their their music is not contemplative sweet they don't sing sweet sad ballads <laughs> it's just like, like it's noisy loud goes at full speed and they never um they ne- they're not interested in quiet <laughs> <You know? laughs> um so you know they're not uh, the metis are not the quiet noble savages there's just that's <laughs> not who they are if you can ascribe a a character to a people they're not they're just not quiet it's they a beautiful it <laughs> it, it's a beautiful reminder because we're so used to having our ipods or our, or our iphones and having apple music spotify we're so used to that that we a don't really share music the same way we used to and all participate but you also think of long travels how do you keep yourself entertained how do you uh, keep the energy up when everybody is tired and i know when i'm on a run i i listen to music and it gets me amped up and i'll listen to a certain rap song and it'll just get 
get me right hyped back up. And that's energy to your mind. It's, it fuels yeah. you. And so you have to think people needed that back then. And there would have been a process for that. And it was just such a beautiful reminder that that was a unique aspect, but such mm -hmm. an important aspect to be able to move forward. Would you also mind telling us about the Michif language? Yeah, so the, the language, that's the language of the Métis Nation. It's a really unique language. Um, so it one of the unique things about it is that nobody outside the Métis Nation knew it even existed until the 1960s. Uh, and that's not to say it only came into existence then. It's just that it was not a language that people spoke outside of the family. If, if the minute a stranger came into a group people would start to either speak Cree. Back in the 1700s, 1800s, people would either, if it was a First Nations person, they would probably move to Cree. If it was uh, a, Fran a, a European, they would move to French because French and Cree were what you would call the lingua franca of the prairies. Um, so everybody spoke French and Cree. Um, or they would move into English um, or some kind of, you know, combination of those three um but basically they never spoke their machif language to anyone other than another machif and so it was hidden and it's not until this danish um linguist came to i think he came to saskatchewan in the 1960s and he was studying cree and he heard these people speaking this language and his ears perked up and he went, wow, what is that? That's, that's, no, it's not great. What, what are they talking? And so he went over and talked to them and, uh, and started to, and got so intrigued with this that he went into a deep study of it. And so he, uh, his study is really fascinating. He's published a book on it. And um, essentially what he's saying is that it is, a lang there's only one other language in the world that's like Machif, and that's the language that the gypsies or the Roma people speak. And so what it is is that you're taking nouns from one language, but the taxonomy and the grammar is from another language. So, for example, if, if I were speaking Machif and you spoke Cree, you would understand a lot, but you'd be going, wow, wow, what is this? Likewise, if you were French, you would hear a lot of French nouns, but you wouldn't understand the the rest of it. So, and that's apparently the Roma language is there's a lot of German in it, and there's other languages in it, but it's got its own taxonomy, and that's what Machif has. So, it's a very unique language, and um, there are dialects of it. If you're up in northwestern Saskatchewan, it is basically more Cree than French. If you're down where I'm from, Red River Métis in St. Boniface, Manitoba, it's got more French and less Cree. But it's still, but they can still understand each other, the two different dialects. So there's the sort of what we call Northern Machif or Southern Machif. And um, so, it, but it is its own, it's not a patois, it's not just a slang, it's its own unique language. And we think it's been around since the late 1700s or late 1700s, early 1800s, because some of the songs that are in the Chif, we have actually written down from like 1820. So we know it's been around for about, you know, at least 200 years. Um, and it is a really, it's very unique to the Métis. And since you're talking about what, you know, if you're talking about what makes a people or a nation of people, language is one of the key, key things. They need to have their own language. And otherwise, they're not a they're not a distinct group. They're sort of uh, bleed into other groups. So, so yeah, Machif's and it's very much spoken today. There's lots of Machif. It's not a, I don't think it's an endangered language. There's quite a few people who are still speaking it alive today. It's not like, unfortunately, like, you know, uh, I was talking to Terry Lynn um, Davidson, Williams Davidson, and she, who's Haida, and I think she said there's only three fluent Haida speakers. There's people, she can speak a bit of it and a lot of people, but there's only three really fluent left. And, well, I don't think the chips anywhere near that. I think there's quite a few people who are really fluent.
Yeah. For the Helklamalum language, there's only one fluent speaker left in who's able to speak that. So it is considered an endangered language. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to ask one last question. When we're thinking about the challenges that the Métis have faced to be recognized, to be respected, to have their Section 35 interests respected, I'm wondering what would you say to municipal, provincial, federal governments, what would you say to First Nations communities on the the impact the Métis has had and what they should know about the Métis, how they should understand them? Well, I think, first of all, that they should understand them as a separate people, that they are a people. They're not just half First Nations or half this. There's a separate and distinct group there. And that's important that everybody understands that. Um, so, and I, I think we're on the way to recognizing their rights Um you know, I did the first case at the Supreme Court of Canada that took Métis rights to the Supreme Court of Canada, and the, and the Supreme Court was very clear. And we've had um, that there are that the Métis are distinct people, and that they have Section Thirty Five rights. So we've had a couple of other important cases since then at the Supremes that have um, reinforced that uh, decision. So I think that uh, in law they're recognized now. Um, where the boundaries are is a, you know, that's a question for lots of First Nations and lots of um, Métis. I mean, I know for the the Stalo, right, you know, where's the boundaries or, you know, people fight over these things. It's, it's fine. It's standard. People fight over boundaries. There's a clear group of Stalo, you know, in, in the middle there. And the edges, where does that boundary between the captains and the Stolo go, you know, those are, you know, those are, those are debates that will probably go on for another 150 years, you know, and the Métis Nation has the same thing. We sort of got this prairie core, but how far into Ontario, how far into BC, da, da, da. Yeah, we fight over those, those boundaries, but the core group is solid. And so, um, I, so I think those are the things that people need to recognize. And then as you know, so some of the things there are self-government rights, the self-government agreements that are being um, signed and enacted into law, pretty much as we speak. Um, and I'm I, I'm pretty sure those are going to go through. Uh, the Manitoba Métis Federation has a treaty that's coming. Um, so I think that that this is very different from where it was when I was growing up. Right. You know, we're 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 a thousand miles from where Beautiful. it was when I was born in the 50s when the Métis were all stupid, dirty, diseased, drunken, um, less than human, you know, people. Um, so things have come a long way. We have a ways to go, <laughs> but but I think things are better. Our stories are appearing. People are starting to understand. And so so I'm, I actually am retiring my law career uh, pretty hopeful. I also see so many wonderful young people coming up who are um, picking up the the battle and carrying it on. I'm, I'm, you know, there's a beautiful young Métis lawyer, Genevieve, um, Genevieve uh, Benoit. I used to, she used to sit on my lap and color when we were at Métis meetings back 25 years ago she's a lawyer now she's working for the Métis nation she's wonderful i so i i just think no i'm i'm very very proud of our new young generation coming along they're doing well i look at the manitoba Métis federation they just bought a huge major building at the portage at the corner of portage and Maine, which is the major intersection in downtown winnipeg um <laughs> No, they're gonna, you know, the there there are billboards up for the Red River Métis in the Ottawa airport, you know, of all places. Like so I think that they're doing well. And Brilliant. so I'm I'm happy about that. I think like I said, I think we've got a ways to go. People the Canadian public needs to learn more about Métis and all indigenous people. But, I couldn't agree more. Yeah, but I think you know you know, things are 
what is it Martin Luther King said, the arc of justice bends, you know, the arc of history is bending towards justice. Yeah. And I think that's true for indigenous people right now. It's bending towards justice. We're not there yet, but it's bending that way. And uh, and I think, you know, I spent my law career trying to help bend that <laughs> right, in that right. direction. And and I think I helped. And so, um, but I like I said, I'm very hopeful because the young people are smart and dedicated and working hard uh, towards all Indigenous rights and and. To me, that's great. I will sit back now and go back to my art career and watch with uh, enjoyment as you, Aaron, and um, your generation just pick up the ball and run with it. Beautiful. Jean, thank you so much for doing this. The Northwest is Your Mother is available on Audible, audiobooks. It is available in physical copies. I highly recommend people check it out. Thank you so much for sharing your time today. Thanks for this, Aaron. I really enjoyed it.